The first prize, not in any order, goes to Teresa Betancourt of the United States for her abstract family-based promotion of mental health in children affected by HIV, a pilot randomized control trial in Rwanda. Of course, no research is ever done by the first author alone. It's always a team, and we're thrilled that Simona Chowdhury is going to come and collect the award on her behalf. I will ask um, Chere to award it. Can everyone give a hand? Each country, each region has its own epidemic. The proportions of key populations in each country, each region are also different. However, key populations share one same thing, an extremely high risk of acquiring HIV. And the risk is 49 times higher in transgender women compared to general populations, 24 times higher in men who have sex with men and people who inject drugs, 10 folds higher in sex workers and five fold higher in prisoners. So how do we achieve prevention equity? And we all know that populations at high risk, highest risk for HIV are being left behind in so many settings. In women, we have heard a lot from yesterday's plenary session. They are facing harmful gender norms and inequalities. They are facing insufficient access to education and health services. In men who have sex with men, transgender women, people who inject drugs, sex workers, they are all being marginalized due to stigma and criminalization towards same-sex relationship, um, drug use, and also sex works, which limit their access to HIV services, and also create reluctance among providers in order to reach out to them. Therefore, innovative packages of HIV testing and prevention tools need to be designed and delivered with meaningful, with true, with sincere involvement of each population for their own populations. Let's start with a key movement in Thailand first. In my country, more than 50% of new HIV cases occur in men who have sex with men and transgender women. However, HIV testing coverage among these key populations are still less than 30%. Therefore, the key population-led test and start program has been initiated with support from USAID PEPFAR for drop-in centers in four key provinces who are working with men who have sex with men and transgender women. The key population-led test and start program has proved feasible and very effective in reaching and bridging high-risk MSM and TG into the program, as you can see, in, uh, see here with a high prevalence of HIV at 16%. The program can also reach the MSM and TG who had lower levels of education and income as compared to those who accessed a conventional HIV testing clinic. The program can also diagnose those with HIV at an earlier stage with a median CD4 count of only 375, which is much higher than a median CD4 count of just above 100 at the national level. The key population program can also successfully link those who tested positive into care with 83% successfully started ART within the median time of only 15 days after HIV diagnosis. And at six months after ART, 82% already achieved viral load suppression. We really need to have deliberate efforts to achieve elimination. And then when that's happened, continuous efforts to stay there. Elimination of disease, this came out of the MMWR. It said elimination and eradication are the ultimate goals of public health. They carry with them an awesome responsibility, which I know you all carry on your shoulders here. And there is no room for failure. But the only question is whether these goals are to be achieved in the present or some future generation. I'm going to talk about the elimination of disease in terms of tuberculosis and hepatitis B and C. And I'm going to do it from a clinical perspective, because that's what I am, a clinician. What are the clinical developments that can contribute to all the other efforts to help eliminate these diseases? Now imagine a disease 
Imagine a disease that spread through the air. It sounds like science fiction and has infected two billion people around the world, one in four of the population, that's become a leading cause of, de of death from infections, surpassing HIV, where 95% of the cases and 98% of deaths are in the developing countries and comprise 25% of all avoidable deaths. Imagine a disease where 75% of the cases are in the economically productive age group 15 to 50 years, that disease is tuberculosis. It's been the number one killer over the past centuries. Nearly nine and a half million people become sick with TB every year, and one and a half million people die. That's 4,400 people every single day from tuberculosis. This is the so-called long game. Can TB be ended by 2035 here. Well, if we carry on as we are, and we're doing okay, we're trying, working hard, if we carry on as we are, we won't get there. We really need to optimize our current tools and pursue universal health coverage and social protection. But by 2025, we should have new protective drugs to prevent TB and a new vaccine, and then we can really get going an average about 17% year drop. If we don't do that, we won't make it. We need a new TB vaccine. Our old one's 95 years old. I'm not saying being old is not so good. I'm standing here today. <laughs> but we need a new vaccine that could prevent adolescents and adults uh, from developing and transmitting TB. And it would be the single most cost-effective tool in mitigating the epidemic. Even if we had a vaccine that was only 60% efficacious and we only gave it to 20% of the people, we would avert until 2050 up to 50 million deaths. Each life is precious. There is a global pipeline of TB vaccine candidates and we hope by the time we get to 2025, one, at least one of these will have come to fruition. We are here together to demonstrate that HIV is still the world's most pressing global health issue. In the US, we have 45,000 new cases yearly, and globally, more than two num million new infections per year. Frankly, just a stunning number. In the US, we are still having outbreaks of HIV. This one is in Scott County, a small rural county in Indiana that accrued over 160 cases of HIV over a three-month period of time, essentially all related to intravenous substance use. I think we must all acknowledge we are a long ways away from what any epidemiologist would consider an AIDS-free generation. Now we have over the last decade had wonderful additions to our HIV prevention toolbox as outlined here in the slide borrowed from Tony. ARVs for PrEP, PMCC, treatment as prevention, medical male circumcision, and some progress in the microbicide field. All of these approaches can make a difference. But there are caveats. Although many of these prevention strategies have high efficacy in clinical trials, the ability to saturate communities with these interventions for real-world effectiveness and hence the long-term effects on population-based incidents are unclear. Do not construe that I am saying that they do not all deserve support and increased uptake. Test and treat is very effective at the individual level. And as we begin the Herculean effort to get more people on treatment, maybe, eventually, we will see population-based effects. But with asymptomatic acquisition, prolonged subclinical infection, and sexual transmission, getting to what I would consider for my grandchildren to be an AIDS-free generation, which is less than 2,500 cases a year in the US and less than 100,000 cases globally, in other words, a 95% reduction from current areas or concurrent numbers, that kind of control will only be achieved with an effective and potent vaccine, one that is widely distributed and durable. And this article concurs in that belief. Now, there are two major scientific questions facing the HIV vaccine field. The first is, can non-neutralizing antibodies be induced in high enough magnitude, high enough duration, and quality to achieve the desired minimum useful efficacy of a vaccine, a 50% reduction in acquisition for at least two to three years? 
Can we do this by designing better recombinant proteins, ones that, for example, enhance antibodies to the V1, V2 loop, as I will discuss in a minute, and then by employing novel adjuvants or eliciting helper T cell responses that enhance the function and durability of these non-neutralizing antibodies. The second issue is can broadly neutralizing antibodies achieve protection? The importance of broadly reactive neutralizing antibodies in preventing HIV acquisition is perhaps the most widely believed gospel in the HIV vaccine field. However, there are examples within viral diseases, one that I, ones that I work on, such as HSV and CMV, that have shown that vaccines that elicit neutralization in in vitro assays that we think should work do not actually reduce acquisition of these infections. In other words, in vitro neutralization does not always mean in vivo efficacy. The joint winner was for an excellent abstract, which was index tracking model as a strategy in finding children and adolescents and improving effective referrals. So important. This is based in Lesotho, and it gives me great pleasure to award this to Mahalitso Jubilee, if she could come up. long-term, which is the change in norms and uh, the gender equality, that is long-term. But we also have to start breaking it down into what are the actions now that will get us there. We kind of tend to talk about it, but we haven't actually had drawn a pathway to it. The, the, the more important thing in terms of what we need to do now, I think, is in terms of being able to put services out there. It, it always fascinates me that my illiterate auntie, who is a uh, you know, in the village, uh, she lost her husband, um, is able to go buy, she knows where to buy a 20 shilling, uh, 10 shilling, Kenya shilling, which is perhaps about a pence um, of airtime. She knows where to load it. Uh, she knows how to do hash um, star 254. And the fact that she doesn't know where to buy a condom is problematic. The fact that a young person in the village, young girl, young boy, who is getting into this age, does not know where to be able to access a service or a product that we are saying will help them prevent themselves as a problem. So our marketing strategies must change. We must be able to start to deliver the products in a way that people begin to want them, are interested in using them, and we teach them how to use it. We actually invest in doing that. And I think, you know, the air communication companies are really something to teach us how we can do that. Um, the, the, the third piece in, in terms of being able to put services out there comes back to the question of um, smart investments and being able to ask ourselves, what is it that we have lost somewhere along the way? We started off with campaigns for treatment, uh, for, for testing and counseling, campaigns where we said everyone must know their HIV status. And today everyone says, well, they were a waste of money. But when I look at the numbers that there are, most of the young people you've just described do not know their HIV status, only about half in just about most of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa. But we are not driving knowledge the knowledge of HIV status, whether it is by self-testing or whatever other mechanism and product that is there. Information, just correct knowledge on HIV. Most demographic health surveys are showing between 50 to 70 percent of correct knowledge. That is very problematic. So, and we are not driving that kind of information. So until we kind of go back to the basics and say, let's flood information out there. Let's avail services. Let people know where to get a service. When I was young, I knew where to get a VCT because it was in my face, it was all over, and I had to get tested. So that is where our investment will be. And it will only happen 
And I think I will say this, and be sustainable if we build the systems for it, and that is through government. The only way to ensure accountability is to strengthen the systems of accountability. You know, I think the way I think about it, Slim, is that every single sort of aspect of this needs R&D. So even the stuff we need to do today, and there's no doubt we need to take it to scale, that can be improved, and there's R&D around how you take it to scale. So I know at this conference we're talking about self-testing, that will enable us to reach more people. Those tests can be improved. In this conference we're talking about differentiated models of care. That will enable us to get more people onto treatment with the efficiencies that, that Bill is saying we need to find. So I think there's stuff that really needs to be done and money is required to get that work done around how we improve what we already know. And then there are some fantastic new good ideas that need to be optimized. So definitely oral prep is in that group. And oral prep is absolutely part of combination pre prevention today. We know it works. In the, in, in the same way that we know harm reduction works and we know that these other tools that are very important are there, but even there we can see some optimization. So my passion, as you know, is adolescence. We know that adolescents struggle to take a daily pill, uh, but I'm excited that uh, within the research field, we're saying this can be improved. Uh, and so certainly there are individuals who will do better if there's less frequent dosing, or if the dosing isn't actually a swallowing an oral pill. We've seen work that has, for example, developed vaginal uh, rings, allowing a more depot approach. There are some very exciting molecules coming down the line which means we may even be able to go even less frequent than a depot eight weekly injection, both for tr treatment and prevention, that I think could revolutionize our prevention revolution. So I think that that R&D is really important. So on the one hand, what we know can be improved and scaled, what we have recently discovered can certainly uh, be optimized, and then of course, very important, is that we keep our eye on the ultimate goal of a prophylactic vaccination uh, or a vaccination scheme that allows us that a young woman or a young man, a key pop, you know, Michael's talk this morning was heartrending. Um, the fact that today, even as we're sitting, 300 young women will have been infected in this country alone is unacceptable. So, you know, getting those tools into those individuals' hands where maybe a shot in the arm forget about HIV for a year or so, you know, before you need to get your booster shot. That's the world we really, really need. We're not going to get there unless we continue to invest in R&D. Well, certainly there's a lot of distractions, uh, economic distractions, political distractions, the, the challenges of the Middle East uh, Syrian-driven refugee crisis that both in that region is hard and uh, for the European governments who are uh, taking people in, which is a, is a great thing, but uh, challenges them. If it wasn't for the AIDS community speaking up and reminding people there is an AIDS emergency, uh, this money really is having a, a very big impact. If it wasn't for that, we'd be at zero. Uh, so it, you know, actually keeping the funding for PEPFAR and Global Fund and the R&D you know, I'd, I'd give us a pretty strong grade in the face of both the economic turmoil and uh, other things going on. You know, I'm still hopeful that we can get modest increases on both the delivery side and uh, delivery side. And, and there's a few governments uh, are, who are be, to be applauded for their generosity. Germany and the UK and many others uh, have shown uh, a very good trend. The US, of course, is by far uh, the biggest funder on, on both fronts, which is, is an amazing thing. It, per case, though, we are, if we're going to treat twice as many people, we're essentially going to have to do it twice as efficiently. Uh, you know, the South African budget is, is prioritizing these things, but it, it won't be able to increase a lot. I don't know the Kenya budget, but I imagine uh, y y the idea of doubling what we get just isn't uh, in the cards. So it does force you to step back and say, wow, doubling the efficiency. Uh, and uh, it's really personnel costs, it's uh, tracking costs, 
Uh, but if we say within this system, are there best practices, you know, community groups in Malawi, dozens of, of best practices, very targeted things that are twice as efficient either in prevention and treatment, then we do see that now that uh, we're more data oriented. So I, it, it is possible if we bring the best practices into the mainstream. If you give people love and compassion and you include them, like LGBT people, like intravenous drug users, like sex workers, like transgender people, you don't leave them behind. You leave no one behind in the human race. You include them all. If you don't, this campaign to end AIDS will be a disaster. All the groundwork, all the wonderful scientific work, all the hard work on the ground from countless people all over the world will count for nothing. Because if we leave these people behind, the disease will spread further and further and further. We have a lot of work to do. And that's why we want to start this project um, to other areas in Africa. I know that certain governments in Africa will not respond um, to someone like me telling me, you should do this, you should do that. I count for nothing as far as that goes. What I can do is ensure that people who are LGBT, if the clinics are closed down because they're LGBT, we can give them medicine, they can get the medicine to someone else. If they're put into arrested, we can get them legal aid. We can help them on the ground. And by bits and bit and bit, I believe, and I don't know how long it will take, but you have to put your foot in the water. And with these countries, sometimes, it, who knows, it might take 50 years, but I guarantee it will change. Because if people are feel inclusive, they will rise up, they will become ACT UP, they will become Stonewall, they will fight for their own rights. We are gonna try with this brilliant help of PEPFAR. $10 million is a lot of money. And we're gonna put it to good use. And we're gonna help all the LGBT people in countries that find it very difficult to be LGBT, to know that we are on their side, we will fight for them, we will fight for their rights, their human rights, their health, everything. We will be there for them.